All right, well, good morning again. That was better. That was good. You guys woke up a little bit between the beginning and just now. Uh, if you don't know, my name is Brian. I'm, I'm one of the pastors here, and I uh, just want to say welcome to you. I want to welcome those that are joining us online as well. We're grateful that you guys are joining us maybe from a distance, uh, or maybe you're checking us out for the first time online. If you are a first-time guest, let me just reiterate a little bit of what Maggie said earlier. Please fill out one of those Connect cards. I'd love to be able to, be able to connect with you and meet you uh, after the service. I'd love to be able to figure out how we can get you better plugged in if you'd like to be so. Uh, so just take one of those green Connect cards she talked about and fill them out, and that would be fantastic. So we've got a lot of stuff coming up this fall. Uh, we've got a lot of stuff coming up even in the next month. We're excited to celebrate with Gina next week uh, in the meal across the street right after this service. Like Maggie mentioned, we got the story that's coming up. Uh, But before we get to the story, we've actually got a series that I think is really going to, it has the ability to touch really every single person in every single seat. Something we see in our culture today is uh, it's talked about a lot, but not really well understood and certainly not understood well in accordance or uh, up against God's word when we compare it against God's word. Um, And it's the issue or the the situation of anxiety. And so we're actually going to be doing a three-week series starting next week called Anxious for Nothing. And uh, as you leave today, you're actually going to get two of these cards, and these are, we call these Invest Invite cards, and so it's an opportunity for you to take those and maybe find a friend, neighbor, family member, coworker who's not plugged into a church somewhere, or maybe is dealing with this very situation of anxiety, um, and invite them to come and check this out. I really think this is one of those um, series um, throughout our year that really has the, the potential to, to have a great impact um, on our families and on us personally uh, as we see what God's Word has to say about this, this uh, situation of anxiety. So uh, be sure to check that out next week. And make sure you grab a couple of those cards on your way out as well. Now, today's a very special day. As you saw, we've already dedicated several of our, of our children here to the Lord. And uh, so what I thought I would do today is just address our parents in the room and address the community here. And when I say community, I mean all those who call BCC home, all those who attend here regularly, uh, the community. I thought I'd address all of you in this idea of what do we do in, when we're parents? What do we do when we're raising children? And so I'm going to pray for us, and then we're going to jump into that topic of how we raise our kids well. Father, we're grateful for the chance to open your word, and we just ask that you would be um, just uh, in, in, our, in our midst here, Lord. Would you, would you meet with us by way of your Holy Spirit? Would you uh, speak to hearts? God, would you encourage uh, parents? Would you sharpen parents? Would you sharpen this community uh, to be more like you in the way that they are intentional with the kids that uh, call BCC home? And uh, we pray, as always, that you'd help us to leave uh, changed and not the same. In Jesus' name, amen. So uh, I heard a story uh, recently about this bagpiper. He was apparently a very famous bagpiper. I didn't even know those existed, uh, famous bagpipers. Uh, but he, uh, he had a lot of these big gigs that he would do, these big festivals and different things that he would do. Uh, but one day he was asked by a funeral director um, to do a homeless man's funeral uh, for free. This, this homeless man had no family or friends, and uh, the ceremony or the, the funeral was to be held in a pauper's cemetery in the backwoods of Kentucky. And so the bagpiper had a big heart, and he agreed to do so. Well, not being familiar with the area in Kentucky where the cemetery was, the bagpiper got lost on his way to the cemetery. And by the time he made his way to the cemetery, it was a couple hours after the ceremony or the funeral was supposed to have taken place. And when he got there, the, uh, the hearse was gone. It was nowhere in sight. The pastor was gone. And only the grave diggers remained uh, there by the graveside. And as the bagpiper walked up to the grave, he looked in and the vault lid had already been put in place. And the diggers stood to the side eating their lunch. Well, the bagpiper didn't really know what to do, and he wanted to honor this homeless man who didn't have any family or friends and any money, so he he just began to play. And he played with all of his heart, played with all of his might for about 30 minutes. He played all kinds of songs, and uh, when he got to the last song, he played Amazing Grace. And as he got to the first chorus, he just began to weep uncontrollably. And uh, the grave diggers at this point had kind of, they were having lunch. They put their sandwiches down. They were weeping as well by the time he closed out the song uh, Amazing Grace. Grace, and when he finished playing, he packed up his bagpipes and he began to walk away. And one of the diggers looked around after he had left and he said, I've never seen anything like that ever before, and I've been putting in septic tanks for 20 years. <sighs> he, he was a bit out of touch, wouldn't you say? Uh, had no idea with what was going on with that septic tank. Uh, you know, and as I was thinking about that story, you know, there, there's There's areas of your life, there's times in your life where you can get by with being checked out. You can get by with being out of touch. Um, There there are some areas that aren't of utmost importance, but there's also areas in your life and things in your life and people in your life that you can't be checked out when it comes to those specific people. 
And, and I would just submit to you this morning, as we kind of jump into this topic of raising children, when you are raising children as parents and as a community of believers, that's a time when we can't be checked out. Because here's the thing, parenting and raising children is a full-time job. All the parents in the room say amen. Yes, it absolutely is. And sometimes you might wonder, what have I gotten myself into, right? You might, it, sometimes you wonder that at the beginning. Sometimes you wonder it in the middle. Sometimes you wonder it when, like, you know, they say the cat comes home, when that adult child comes back again, you know, uh, after he's already left. You know, you might wonder, what have I gotten myself into? Uh, for the new parents in the room that have babies, uh, you walk around the first six months in what I call the zombie phase, you know? You, you're not getting any sleep. You've got bloodshot eyes. You've got a bottle in your pocket of milk, you know what I mean? and maybe a bottle of something else, depending on how well you're not, not sleeping or how you are sleeping, right? Your, your nostrils are filled with the, the remains and scent of, of spit up, even though there's no spit up present. Somehow you still smell it on everything, and it can be hard. Um, it, it, traveling with baby, once you have a new baby, isn't it fun how you have to learn how to travel again? Like when you were, whenever you were single or whenever you were first married and didn't have kids, you could just grab like a backpack and be like, hey baby, let's go to the mountains for the weekend. Or you can grab a carry-on. When you have a child, it is a different story. Uh, we've got some, some friends that when they take a vacation, they almost have to rent a U-Haul truck to carry all of the baby stuff. It's baby strollers and rockers and baby bath, portable baby bathtubs. Like just craziness, you know. Uh, it was actually funny as I was speaking of transporting baby things. I was preparing this message a couple weeks ago. We were up in Michigan for a family reunion, which went really well, by the way. No one got shot and there were really no arguments. So it was a good, it was a good family reunion. Um, but I was sitting in a coffee shop. Uh, I made a little escape one day to get away. And uh, I, I was sitting in a coffee shop at this little bar uh, area, having a cup of coffee, looking out the front window at like the main street going through town there uh, where we were at. And, and I saw this massive pickup truck with a baby rocker in the bed of the truck just drive right by. As I'm typing this out, I was like, that was perfect. Now, I don't know if the baby was in there or not. I mean, it could have been. I hope not. But parents, desperate times call for desperate measures when that baby won't sleep, right? You will throw that thing anywhere you have to to make it go to sleep. But here's the thing. You might wonder, what have I gotten myself into? Because what you have is not what you were expecting when you were expecting. See, what you have is not what you were expecting when you were expecting. You read the baby manuals. You saw the baby magazines with that happy baby on the front. And your baby's throwing up all the time. You know, it's, it, it looks a little bit differently. Uh, our, our, our oldest, Madison, she was our she was our puker. I mean, that's just the way she was, you know. We got her a shirt that even, no, we didn't do that for her. But, but she was. And, and, and it's difficult. It doesn't quite look like that magazine or like that book that you read. And it's not quite as dreamy all the time as you would like it to be. And you wonder, what have I gotten myself into? What I would say is what you've gotten yourself into, first of all, is a relationship. It's a relationship. And it's a relationship with a lot of pressure to get it right, isn't it? It's a lot of pressure to get it right. And let's just go ahead and lay this out there. As a parent, you're not going to be perfect. There's no way you're going to be perfect. And, and our culture puts a lot of pressure on us to be so. But I, I don't know about you, but for me, I've found sometimes I teach my kids best even when I make mistakes. You know what I mean? I, I don't know if you've ever been there as a parent. I'm sure that you have. I know I've been there many times. I think sometimes even in those mistakes, you have a more powerful teaching moment than in the good times. Those moments when I have to come to my kids and say, hey, you know, Maddie or, or Claire or Carter, D Daddy was wrong in the way he responded to you earlier. I'm sorry for what I said and the way I said it. Let me just tell you why Daddy shouldn't have responded that way. See, those moments like that when you're not perfect and you're real and you're genuine and you're humble, those can be some of the best moments of teaching for your children. But, but, but here's the thing. Our culture puts a lot of pressure on you to get it right. You know, as I, I tell you this, moms, you guys have a hard job. You have a really hard job. And you have a whole lot more pressure, even than us, I think, as men sometimes in our culture. Moms are pressured to just be these perfect model, like, like front of the magazine of the baby magazine, perfect moms. And you got to give your kids the organic applesauce, you know what I mean? Not regular. We grew up on just cheap dollar per can, like applesauce, you know what I mean? And now you got to buy the $5 organic one, right? When it comes to cleaners, you got to buy the cleaners that don't have cleaning stuff in them, you know what I mean? Like as a parent, or you're not a good parent, you know, when it comes to like kids in school, their college prep classes seem to start at like age five now, you know what I mean? And there's all this pressure to get it right. But listen, you're not going to be perfect at it, and that's okay. I'll say this too to our community, to those who may be in the room that don't have kids or empty nesters or you're single or you're young married, you don't have kids yet, you're not going to be perfect at it either. But our goal, we're going to see in a minute, is really to be an example to the kids. It's best that we know how to be, but we're not going to be perfect. You're going to make some mistakes. But I'll say this. 
when you're raising children, one of the most beautiful things about that relationship with its highs, with its lows, with its good times, with its bad, with its moments of celebration, with its moments of sadness, that relationship that's been started between you and your child will drive you as the parent to Jesus. And we pray one day it'll drive that child to Jesus as well. That's, that's our prayer. Um, I, I know for, for Sonia and myself, we've been at it for about 10 years now with our kids. We've got three. Um, and, and there are so many moments in parenting where, you, listen, I've told you guys before, your pastor's not perfect. We don't float down the stairs in the white robes with the hallelujah chorus and the glow behind us. I mean, sometimes I do. But, you know, like, no, we don't. We're not perfect. But we've just learned, like, that, that those moments of parenting can be so sharpening for us uh, even as the parent, even when we're dealing with situations with our children. And so what I want us to do for a few minutes today is I want us to talk about how do we operate in this new relationship as we're raising children. If this is this relationship that's going to drive us to Jesus and it's going to drive our children to Jesus, how do we operate this relationship? If you've got a Bible, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 1. If you don't, there's one in the seat back in front of you, and I'm going to put it on the screen as well. 1 Samuel chapter 1 is where we're going to go in just a moment. Um, as you're turning there, let me give you a little bit of context as to what's happening in this story. Samuel, written by the prophet named Samuel, uh, same guy that uh, anointed King David, same guy that anointed King Saul, if you remember any of those stories from when you were young in Sunday school, whatever. Uh, most of you have heard of David and Goliath, who eventually became king. This is the guy who anointed him king and set him up as king. Samuel is. He wrote this book, but the story in the book actually begins with a woman named Hannah, who we're going to find out is Samuel's mother. Now, when the story begins, Hannah had been barren for many years, means she was unable to have children. She and her husband had tried for a very long time to have uh, a child, but could not. And maybe many of you in the room today have even dealt with that. I know that's something that we see a lot in our culture, infertility, and not being able to have a, ch a child can be one of the hardest things on a couple and in their marriage. Um, it can be something that can drive you apart. It can be something that brings a lot of sorrow, not being able to have a child. And in this culture, it was even an, a, an even bigger deal. Uh, we, we, we obviously look at children today as a blessing from the Lord in our culture. But back then, as a woman, if you weren't able to bear a child, you were almost kind of like an outcast and you were shamed. As a matter of fact, in this story that we're going to look at here in just a minute, uh, Hannah's husband, Elkanah, that was his name, or Elkanah, is however you want to pronounce that, he actually was allowed to take a second wife, uh, and, and we're not going to get into all that either, okay? We're not getting into all the details of that. I would just advise don't do it because you don't want a second set of in-laws. That's just, the, that's what I would just <laughs> submit to you, you know? Like, let's just leave it there for now. Uh, I have good in-laws. I love you, Dad and Mom Baker. I love you. Uh, listen, I really do. But, but he took a second wife, and she was able to bear him children. And then Elkanah, we're going to find out, actually made fun, or uh, Elkanah's second wife made fun of Hannah and shamed her er, uh, daily. It says it constantly was shaming her and making fun of her and belittling her. And so she carried around this shame for a long time of not being able to have a child. And so this is what we find Hannah dealing with. Well, Hannah goes to the tabernacle, which is where they worshiped. It kind of be their version of church in this context here. Okay. And uh, she was pleading with God to give her a son uh, and praying and asking him, but she went even further. She said, God, if you'll give me a son, I actually will dedicate him and I will give him back to you. For his whole life, I'll dedicate him back to you if you'll just give me a son. And as she was praying, she was praying so intensely that uh, she, she had her eyes closed and her mouth was moving, her lips were moving, but there was nothing coming out. And she was praying. Well, the priest sees her from the tabernacle and comes walking out, and he, he thinks she's drunk. That's what the story says. Thinks she's had too much to drink. And, and he goes, what are you doing out here? You don't need to be, you can't be drunk like this out in front of the church. And she says, no, 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 Eli. Listen, the, the priest's name was Eli. He said, Eli, no, I'm not drunk. I'm just pleading with God to give me something very special. Well, Eli didn't know what it was, but Eli says, well, hey, I'm, I'm going to show mercy to you. And I just, I want to tell you, I, I pray that God will give you what you've asked of him. And in fact, God eventually did. If you read on in the story, God granted her uh, a son because Hannah and her husband were eventually able to conceive not long after this. And they had a son and they named him Samuel. Everybody say Samuel. Again, same Samuel that anointed the kings that we talked about. And here's what's great about it is that Hannah never forgot her vow to God. The vow that she was going to dedicate him. And so she took him and uh, weaned him, it says, and then took him to the tabernacle and dedicated him to God. The Lord. And that's where we're going to pick up the story in verse 27. Look there with me. Verse 27 says, this is Hannah speaking, I prayed for this child, and the Lord has granted me what I asked of him. So now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life, he'll be given over to the Lord. She dedicated him to God. That is, she brought him to the tabernacle and presented him to the priest Eli. And then she left Samuel there at the tabernacle for Eli to raise. And she went home. 
Now hold on, parents. That's not what we're doing here today, okay? You can't leave your kids here today. This is not what we're doing, all right? We love seeing your children come to church, but many Sundays we're really happy to see them go home with you, okay? So that's not what's happening here. It's a little bit different in our context today. Just let's be clear with that. But seriously, in Hannah's dedication of Samuel, I think she teaches us something that we need to realize, all of us as parents, this is specifically for the parents, about our children as we raise our children. And it's this, we must be open-handed. Be open-handed as you're raising your children. We have to remember, this is so important, that our children are not ours. Our children have been given to us by God to steward for Him. A steward doesn't own anything, do they? They're just taking care of the affairs of someone else. And God has given us our children that he's blessed our families with. He's given you maybe even the foster children that you're fostering right now. These are to be stewarded for him. And Hannah understood this and dedicated Samuel back to God. Think about it. After all those years of waiting, after all those years Hannah endured of embarrassment, of being unable to conceive, after the taunting that she received from her rival wife, uh, right, the other wife of, uh, second wife of her husband, um, after all the years of being shamed in public, she gave her son back to God. See, Hannah could have taken her child and used him for her own advantage, couldn't she? She could have said, I'm going to use him and I'm going to walk around town proud, right? And show everybody that I've got a son and I'm not going to honor my part of the vow that I made to God, right? She could have dressed up Samuel in the finest clothes Baby Gap sells. You know what I mean? Stuck him in a Bob's expensive fancy stroller and had a cup of Starbucks in her hand and went strolling through town, showing off her new baby. But what did she do? She was willing to dedicate him back to God because she understood her child was not her own, that it had been stu- Samuel had been stewarded to her by the Lord. And I think it's so important for us to understand this in our context as well. Now, for us, we may have some moms or dads that want to do what I just described Hannah could do with that stroller and whatever, but I think it plays out a little bit differently for us today. This is something I see often in a lot of families and all over culture for certain, is that uh, one of the ways we try to use our children to our advantage as parents is to try to live through our children try to live vicariously through them. You know what I mean? And sometimes we'll make jokes about it, but it's very much a reality for a lot of families. It plays out something like this. You have a dad who is maybe an athlete in high school or in college, and he puts everything he can. He puts thousands of dollars and thousands of hours into making sure his son or his daughter become these amazing athletes. And, and, And on the surface, it can seem like that's okay. But if you really get to the bottom of it many times, it's not so much about the good of the kid. It's about the dad feeling like he's been, he's accomplished something. It's him maybe being able to do something through his children that he couldn't do on his own when he was in high school. We see the same uh, thing when it comes to moms sometimes. I've seen this many times. A mom has, has a daughter, and she wants her daughter to be the prettiest and the most popular girl in high school. And she does everything she can to push that agenda. And at the end of the day, it's not really for the good of the child. She's using her for her own advantage because that's what she wished she had had when she was in high school many years ago, right? And so I think the temptation for us sometimes as parents is to use our children to our advantage as some sort of status symbol, as some sort of way to live vicariously through them, but our job is to steward them for the Lord, to understand they're not ours. We're to do everything we can to point them back to God, their heavenly Father, so that they one day can place their faith in Him. Now, Hannah took this very seriously, obviously. She was willing to to give back her one and only son, uh, Samuel, to God. Now, how do we do that? Look over at Deuteronomy with me real quick. Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you've got a Bible, it's in the Old Testament. Get in the middle of the book and then go way left near the beginning. Okay, that's where it's at. Deuteronomy chapter 6 gives us some incredible insight on how we can live open-handedly, okay? How we can be open-handed with our children. Now, the author of Deuteronomy is Moses. Remember the guy with the big, long, white beard and the staff? That guy? Remember that guy? He wrote this, okay? And he's writing to the people of Israel, okay, here in, in this. But the application and principle applies very much to us as parents in a community. He says, Hear, O Israel. So he addresses them as a community here. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. So not only are we to be open-handed when we're raising our children, but here Moses tells us that we're to be an example. We're to be an example to our children. Look what he said. He says, love God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. See, that's all about your walk with God, parents. 
That's all about your walk with God, BCC, as a community. That has nothing to do, really, even with the children. It has everything to do with your personal walk with God and your responsibility as a parent and our responsibility as a community of believers around these families is that these kids see our close walk with Jesus. Because here's the reality, whether you know it or not, your life is teaching your children what's important in life. Your life is teaching your child what's important in life, which is why your walk with God is so important. You're to love him. You're to chase Jesus with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Because oftentimes you might be saying the right things to your kids, but they're watching what you're doing far more than what you're saying. Your life is teaching your child what's important in life. Now, I've taught this idea for a long time. I was a student pastor for about 12 years. I've been a campus pastor before as well, um, and I've taught this, but I've, I've recently seen this lived out in a very real way in our family, this whole idea of an example. So let me, let me explain what I mean. Uh, my kids are Tar Heel fans, okay? Uh, if you don't know, I'm, I am from originally from North Carolina, and I am a diehard Tar Heel fan, okay? But my kids are Tar Heel fans. I know that offends all the Jayhawk fans in the room because we stole your coach. I know. I know it offends you, and it offends the Kansas State people because, you know, the Tar Heels win more games than they do in basketball. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that, okay? Uh, but, but, we're, but they're Tar Heel fans. Uh, yesterday, my daughter Claire came walking down the hall. I'm sitting in the living room with, having a cup of coffee with my wife, and, and my, my daughter Claire comes coming down the hall, has a Tar Heel T-shirt on. I was like, yes, I'm so proud. That's a great choice. That's such a great choice, Claire. You know, uh, whenever my daughters were younger, uh, Madison specifically, uh, my parents bought her a Tar Heel cheerleading outfit. It was like one of the cheerleading outfits, like what, they, what the cheerleaders wear at uh, UNC. And she'd wear it with pride. Maddie begs to watch the games with me. Now, back during March Madness, uh, my, my boys didn't go as far as I really would have liked them to have gone. You know, I realized that. But the last couple of games, I let Maddie sit in there and watch some of those games with me. Um, and and it's, it's amazing to see the, uh, the zeal that they can have for uh, their dad's team. And you say, well, how did that happen? How did my kids, who themselves have only lived in the North, in North Carolina area for two or three years, how could they become such uh, super fans? It's because dad loves the Tar Heels. See, they learn from my example day in, day out for their entire lives. I didn't have to sit them down and teach them why the North Carolina Tar Heels are the greatest basketball team in the history of the world. And as such, they deserve to win every game and get every call in their favor. Someone say amen. I knew you wouldn't. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't. I didn't have to sit them down and teach them that, did I? I didn't have to sit them down and teach them why they should hate Mike Krzyzewski and the Duke Blue Devils. I didn't have to, I don't, you shouldn't hate people, okay? I didn't have to teach them that, though. I didn't have to teach them how to yell at the TV when the call doesn't go our way. We're watching one of those last games in the tournament, and as I said, it didn't go very well, okay, because we didn't win. We didn't win the final game uh, that we played. And, and Maddie's yelling at the TV. I, I couldn't have been more proud in that moment. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, she's learning, she's learning. I didn't have to sit them down and give them a class on that. See, what happened is I reproduced what I was, didn't I? And see, it may not be with your favorite college basketball team. It may not be with your pro team. It may not necessarily be with your hobby. But listen, your kids are watching what you're doing, parents, and you will reproduce what you are. It is so vitally important. That's why Moses tells us, love God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. Because if you're doing that, a lot of this other stuff we're going to talk about kind of takes care of itself. When you're being that right example for your children to follow, that's one way that we can raise our children to not be checked out and raise them up to serve the Lord. Look at what he says here. Continue there in Deuteronomy chapter 6. Verse 6 says again, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. He says, impress them on your children. Everybody say impress them. See, stewarding our children for God doesn't happen by accident. We must be intentional. It must be intentional. See, verse 7 says, impress these commandments on your children. The word impress there that's used in the Hebrew, so it, it, what it carries is this idea of repeating over and over again so you don't forget. It's repetition of the right things. It's teaching them God's word. It's being intentional with your time, committing to, to being willing to teach your children. And oftentimes you don't have to like have a PhD or a theology degree to be able to do this. I think one of the easiest ways, I'll get really practical with you, one of the easiest ways for you to teach your children is to teach them and have conversations with them about what God is teaching you. 
See, it, it, that's real, and that's something God is, has, has given you exposure to, something that's changing you personally, and taking those moments when God's teaching you things and teaching your children the very same thing. You see, it doesn't require a Ph.D., it doesn't require you going to college for a lot of years. It doesn't require you getting degrees. It just requires you being there with your kids and having those conversations to teach them what God is teaching you. I, I think it's very important for parents, too, to communicate the gospel to their children. Now, I, I, we've never done, we never kind of approached it as uh, we want to pressure our kids into becoming Christians because it has to be a personal decision. We talked about that today. The dedication is really more for the parents today than it is for the children. There's got to be a point in their lives where they see themselves as a sinner, unable to save themselves, and they place their faith in Jesus Christ for salvation, and then they make it public by being baptized. See, that's got to be a personal thing, and so we've always tried to have as many conversations as we can about it without pushing them into it because we all know that our kids really do want to please us as their parents. Parents. And sometimes they may say things or do things just to please us rather than because it's a personal faith. But I would just tell you, have any opportunity that you can to, to give them the gospel, to ask them questions. I, we, we do this with our kids sometimes. Hey, who's Jesus? Who is Jesus? Well, he died on the cross. Well, why did he die on the cross? Well, for, because I'm a sinner. Or, and, and they'll say things like that, and they may not understand it just yet. Now, my older two have accepted Christ. Uh, Maddie and, and Claire have accepted Christ. My son Carter, that boy needs, he needs Jesus. He needs to get saved. You know what I mean? I told you a few weeks ago about how he was talking about shooting people. You know what I mean? Like, he needs Jesus. Um, but, but we'll ask those questions, and we'll look for opportunities to have those what seem like simple conversations. But the Holy Spirit of God can take those. And if we're intentional in those moments, to, to, to look for those moments and then capitalize on them, the Holy Spirit of God can take those and he can use them. And I'll just say this. We've had, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of 8 to 10 of our children here at BCC um, accept Jesus Christ and place their faith in him in the last, like, two months. Like, that's something we should celebrate, I believe. Right? Can we celebrate that together? Um, I was going to get the exact number to share with you, and, and I forgot this past week, but, but we've seen a number of our children coming to know Jesus Christ, and I'm just going to tell you, that doesn't happen by accident. See, that happens whenever we as a community are an example. That happens when we as parents are an example. That happens when we are intentional in what we teach them. Now, look, look what it says there as we continue in the passage. We're almost done. Deuteronomy 6, 7 through 9 says, Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Now listen, this is so important. This is the second part of this intentional thing. You can only be intentional when you're present. You can only be intentional when you're present. Look at the list of things that he just gave us there. He says, talk about them when you sit at home. A prerequisite for you sitting at home and talking to them is you being at home, okay? I know that sounds very elementary, but it's true. You've got to be there in order for you to walk with them and talk about it while you walk along the road. Now, it's been like 180 million degrees for the last week. There ain't no walking going on here all right, in Garden City lately. There's not, all right? But when you're in the car... Like you're driving down the road, taking that opportunity when you're present to be intentional in those conversations. One of the easiest ways to have conversations with your kids when, about Jesus when you're driving in the car is to start out a phrase like this. Isn't God good to give us and then fill in the blank with whatever it is you're talking about? We do it with Disney World. I've said it to my kids about Disney World because we know God is good to give us Disney World. Amen? Yes, I know there's a couple of Disney lovers in the room. That's good. Like those moments like that when you're driving around, capitalize on those. Don't just turn the radio up and chuck chicken nuggets at them in the back seat. You know what I mean? Turn the radio down once in a while and have those conversations. But in order for you to be able to have those conversations and be intentional, you got to be present. Which means, parents, we, we may have to set aside some of our hobbies. It may mean that we have to press pause on some career goals that we have. It may mean that we need to put aside that woodworking project or whatever it is you've got in front of you so that you can be present with your children. Because, look, you cannot be intentional if you're not present. It's impossible. And I'll just say this, too. So often we do worry about, I don't know what I would teach my kid. I don't know that much about the Bible. Maybe you're a new Christian. You've just come to Jesus and placed your faith in him. You're like, I don't know a whole lot. Listen, so often your presence is the most valuable thing that you can teach your kid. Just being there with them, being dependable many times is way more important than saying something remarkable. It really is. Like, you don't have to know all the answers. We ought to try to teach them as best that we can. We want to teach your kids back in our children's ministry as best we can. But your presence as a parent is powerful in their lives and has the ability to shape and influence them in a way that no one else can. You've got to be present. You've got to be there. 
And I'd say this lastly. I believe this happens best in community. Part of being intentional is being in community. See, Moses here is addressing a group of people. As I said a moment ago, he's addressing the the people of Israel here, this group of people. And they're to do this together. Now listen, parents, the onus is on you. You're the one that's going to stand before the Lord one day for how you raise your children. That's not going to be on this community. But it is up to this community to help out and remove barriers in any ways that we can for the parents that are in our midst. Am I right? Like, we are to do everything we can to help and encourage the parents that are in our midst. Because you remember how we started this message. It's a hard gig. It's a hard job raising children. And they need a community around them. See, Moses knew that when he wrote this down. And we need it today as well. You need people around you that are encouraging you. You need people around you that are praying for you. You need other parents around you that have already been where you are now. See, you don't know what to do with that 15-year-old that's mouthing off and being rebellious and won't come home when they say they're going to come home, right? You don't know what to do because you've never been there. But guess what? We have a lot of people here that have gone through a whole lot of 15-year-olds. Like, they haven't killed them. Like, but they, you know what I mean? Like, they, they've, they've parented a lot of 15-year-olds, okay? And you can go to them and say, hey, what did you guys do when you did this? See, that's one of the ways community helps. That's one of the ways community allows you to be intentional. Those people can pray for you. They can encourage you. They can give you insight. Because see, you've maybe never been through the terrible twos before, right? But someone else might have. And you can go to them and you can find that wealth of knowledge that's in this community of believers. And part of being intentional is being in community. And maybe you're here today and you don't have any children. I mentioned that already. Maybe you're an empty nester. Maybe you're a grandparent. Maybe you're a young couple that maybe hasn't had children yet. Maybe God hasn't called you to have children or gifted you with children. Maybe he hasn't called you to foster children. But how can you remove barriers and how can you help the people that he has called in our community? So that's a challenge for you that don't have children in the midst. And listen, kids are watching you whether you know it or not, even if you don't have children of your own. I can't believe the number of times that our kids have come home and made a comment about something that some other adult did. And I'm like, how do they even see that? Like, how do they even observe what happened there? And you've probably had the same thing happen with your kids. They're watching your lives. So community, BCC, those who are in here without kids presently, they're watching your life. Your example matters. How you're being intentional matters. And I'll tell you one of the best ways you can be intentional when it comes to our children. You ought to pray for them, like we said earlier. I I think we ought to have a whole lot more people than we do serving in our children's ministry. I'll just be honest with you. We, there ought to be a waiting list to serve in the children's ministry. Listen, I, teenager, like student ministries, teenagers are scary, all right? I'll give you that, all right? They're a little scary. I worked with them for a long time. Kids are not scary. They scream, but they're not scary. You can give them a piece of candy, and they will love you to death. When I was growing up, there was this old guy. I've forgotten his name now because it was a long time ago. This older gentleman that went to our church, and he always had candy. And every Sunday, every child in our church would go up to him, and he would put out his hand and shake our little hand, and he would have like a butterscotch candy in his hand. Butterscotch isn't even good. And we loved him. Listen, kids are so easy to lead in that, in that capacity in our children's ministry. I'm serious. Like some of you guys, maybe God's speaking to your heart right now. You need to go and talk to Jen or talk to Katie or one of our people that lead back there and say, look, I want to start serving. Put me on the schedule once a month. There is no reason why there shouldn't just be a plethora of people back there willing to serve and pour into these children because it's so, so important that we as a community come around these parents who are raising children for God's glory and help them learn how to trust in Jesus and learn that he loves them and learn that he died on a cross for their sin and let them come to a personal faith in Jesus Christ. You can have a part in that. Your influence community, your intentionality community can have an influence on the children that just stood up here on this stage or were held up here on this stage. They didn't stand yet, most of them. Listen, we've got to be intentional, but it only happens in community. So here's what I'd ask you, okay? You can close your Bibles, close your notes. Here's what I want to challenge you to do. Commit to being checked in with your child today. Community. Commit to being checked in with the children around you today. Grandparents, commit to being checked in with your grandchildren today. Because look, here's the deal. If you choose to step back and abdicate that responsibility, there are a lot of substitute teachers that will jump in and take your place. Let them, let them be led by the television. Let them be led by YouTube. Let them be led by their friends. Let them be led and influenced by the culture. Listen, there's a plethora of people and things that will jump in and be the substitute teacher if we don't do what we're supposed to do for our children. Amen? They'll step in and they're going to lead them down a path that they don't want to go down. 
and lead them down a path that you don't want those kids to go down. But it will take us committing to being checked in with our kids when it's easy and when it's hard, when it's convenient and when it's also often inconvenient. We've got to be checked in when it comes to our children. You say, well, Pastor Brian, why is this so important? You know, why is it that we can't be checked out when it comes to raising our children? Think about it this way. Every parent has approximately 936 weeks with their child from birth through high school graduation. Imagine each of those weeks as marbles in a jar, conveniently like the one that's on our stage today. Each one of these marbles represents a week that you can influence your child. And so for every week that passes, you take a marble out and you throw it away. If you do the math, parents, in the room of teenagers, parents of of babies in the room, infants in the room, do the math. You've already lost some weeks. Can you believe that? You've already lost or gone through some opportunities where you could have influenced your child as you pull out a marble for each of the weeks that has already passed. And what I love about a visual like this is that it really gives us perspective on really what we have left. Now, Reggie Joyner is one of the writers of the curriculum that we use for our children's ministry. He said it best when he said, when you see how much time you have left, you tend to do more with the time you have now. When you can visually see these marbles that represent the time that you have left, you tend to do more with the time you have now. But each marble or each week that goes by, their opportunities influence your children well, to teach them and lead them well. If you're checked out, those can be opportunities that slip through our fingers. Missed opportunities that slip through our fingers. But if you're checked in, those are opportunities that you can take hold of and grab onto and use to influence your child to come to know Jesus Christ and to serve him with all their hearts, just like they're watching you do. See, every single marble passing quickly. Time is ticking when it comes to raising our children. What are you doing with the marbles that you have left? What are you doing with the time that God has blessed you to have left with your child before you send them off to college? And see, as parents, as a community, what we do with those marbles, that choice is up to you. But my question for you is, will you be checked in or will you be checked out?